Hi, my name's Tom Ollerton and this is the Shiny New Object Podcast. This is a podcast about new marketing technology and every week I have the privilege of interviewing someone who's interesting, entertaining, funny, clever, influential and this week is no different. I have Jerry Dakin who is the Head of Digital Media Partnerships at Diageo. And before he introduces himself, I am contractually bound to mention the fact that I'm actually very excited about speaking at the Data Driven Creative Conference in New York on the 7th of December. Uh, reach out if you want a discount code for that. Right, banner ad is completed. It's good. I'm sold. <laughs> Can I just say that whole introduction would have been kind of better with a jingle? Like when you introduce yourself, I think that should be like a, a jingle. Uh, you do that afterwards. Oh, sorry, okay. So There was a jingle, was there? Yeah. I loved that jingle, it was really good. We, we can get an AI jingle knocked up pretty quick. Uh, so, Jerry, for people who are listening to this podcast who don't know who you are, can you give us a recap on how you got here? <laughs> Through the lift, but... No, I've, uh, I've, I've been working in uh, digital FMCG marketing for the last decade or two. Uh, did my time at Cadbury... Uh, Gorilla Land, did my time at Cara Agency side and now uh, work at Diageo. Um, have kind of throughout all that time tried to drive a bit of a, a narrative around digital sense. I, I think, you know, digital is this incredibly exciting, disruptive thing that's changing an awful lot of what we do in marketing. At the same time, it's surrounded by like huge amounts of nonsense and hyperbole and stuff that just isn't true or isn't that helpful. Uh, so how do we have like a meaningful and serious discussion about how digital is transforming our marketing and how do we make sure it is transforming our marketing because it's definitely transforming our consumers' lives. So yeah, I've I worked on a, a whole range of really interesting bra- brands. I've been in Dubai helping Cabri establish itself there. I've worked with Cara on what programmatic means for a, for a media agency. And, and now I have the joy of, of selling some of the world's greatest drinks. So if you fancy a pint of Guinness or a, <laughs> a, a Tanqueray and tonic or a Johnny Walker and ginger, um, we can have one halfway through and see how the podcast goes. So you don't say digital sense lightly. So I've been in awe of the fact that you've managed to game LinkedIn to your will uh, and Twitter to a degree. Uh, you have your own hashtag, which is in, in fact digital sense, uh, and you made a huge success of that. So I've always been curious to know what, why digital sense is so important to you. And I know you mentioned that you know you need to make sense of it, but like why have you gone to such lengths to talk about that? Well, I think, you know, work in marketing, so repetition and uh, frequency is quite a key <laughs> thing. It just uh, landed on something that I liked and stuck with it. And I think it's, it's always been a frustration for me that working in digital, um, you can get tarred with the brush of being a bit kind of throwaway and a bit, you know, uh, you do crazy innovation stuff, but actually you don't really know enough about like the core traditions of marketing. And I'm not by any means saying that it's true of everyone or anyone who works in digital but sometimes that's true uh, of the loud voices and things you hear in digital so I just think having real sense and a real kind of business first approach to it's really keen you when you say I owned it there's this guy someone in the US who wrote a book called Digital Sense and he spent like six months (laughs) inspired by you I don't know I don't know if he'd accept that fact but yes let's (laughs) say he did um and for like six months he did try and own it but I I got quite combative and like you know had to like buy the trending topics you, and things like you that. You fought off. You bought a trending topic. I didn't buy I didn't buy a trending topic, but I did I did buy some search terms and some, you know, I did buy some you, some Twitter your media. Own money. Yeah, well, no one else actually well yeah, definitely my own money. The I mean, agency no, didn't pay for that. No one else was willing to pay for my campaign of digital sense. <laughs> and what are we talking about here? Like tens of pounds? Oh yeah, like pounds? tens of pounds. Calm right, down. So you, Calm down. The interest you, in the, the interest in the book wasn't that high. I didn't I didn't <laughs> I didn't have to go that big to, to, to to own the conversation. So but you, I, but I, so no, that, I, no, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to push you on that. No, that I want to be pushed because for me, it was a real passion point as well because okay. I, I told a few colleagues at the time I was doing it and they all said I was bonkers and I learned an awful lot about how Twitter's media worked and what you can do in that space and I think anyone who works in media and has never actually bought a bit of media in their life, you know, give it a try. And I, I could say, I mean, it's a, is it vain? Yes, is the answer you're looking for. But it was also uh, a really useful learning experience, and I enjoyed it. And uh, if I had lots of money, probably I'd I'd do more to to tell the industry what did you some learn other things. From it? You just learn a little bit about like the optimizing of it and how you. I mean, like 
I've always worked in like a strategy team, so I tell people what you can do on Twitter or what you can do on Facebook or what you can do in any media. And it was nice just to log in and see like, oh, actually, these are the options. This is what I can target. This is what I can do. This is what I'm seeing back. Hang on a second. Why aren't we looking at that every day? And why aren't we optimizing to that? And why aren't we using this targeting and this segmentation and, and bits like that? So you... I'm trying to overhype it to make up for the fact that I did a really vain thing, which I've now admitted. No, I, I think that's... <coughs> I, I am taken aback that, that, that you did that. <laughs> but now um, you can do that thing on Twitter where you pay like 80 quid a month or something. It literally just promotes your account, just whatever you're tweeting. I haven't done that. I'd like to clarify <laughs> for the record. But like, they're embracing that as a business well, model. Well, as, as an individual? As an individual. And they promote it in... What's uh, like, it's a com- I think it's a combination of like promoted accounts and also just it randomly promotes some of your tweets, which for me would be really risky because I have... I, brought, I mean, I do tweet some fantastic marketing stuff, but I also tweet a lot about, like, the Eurovision selection process. So you tweet... <laughs> oh, there's two so very many different questions avenues that go down there. Um, so what is the awesome stuff that you tweet? What is... I mean, go just on, follow man. me at Jay Dakin. Yeah, of course. What, what do you talk about? I like to talk about digital sense. Hashtag digital sense. You can follow that as well. So what have you talked about this week? Come on, tell me. Now, this, week has been a, this week has been a poor week for marketing <laughs> okay. and a really strong week for my dog. Like, my dog got in a lot of trouble this week. What do I tweet about? I'd like to tweet about a range of things, like, the, like what's happening in the news. And, you know, there's, there was a big thing with Coca-Cola and Costa this week and just, you know, got in, a, got in a few Twitter discussions about what that really means and what, what they're trying to do in the business. Come That's on. Big, what is my opinion? I mean... Coca-Cola is a really interesting, uh, fantastic business, but they've, you know, they haven't diversified as much as maybe a PepsiCo has. They haven't got their hands in quite so many pies, so it's interesting to see them playing that. And they've, you know, they've straight up said they're going to run the sort of the shop side of the business quite separately. But you know, you give like a Costa, well-known coffee brand, to, to one of the best distributed companies in the world, possibly the best distributed company in the world. It'd be really interesting to see if you're, you know, in a few years' time, will you always be ten meters away from a from a cost of beverage as well. You're always 10 minutes. You always, we already are. Lives, so we already yeah. are, maybe in London. In a lot of cost of isn't quite as uh, universal podcast, everywhere. And, and is, uh, and are you cynical about that? Or like, is it a good thing? Or like... I'm, so, I'm very rarely cynical about anything in marketing. <laughs> I just I love a good I love a good merger I love a good new campaign I'm only cynical of uh, people who over over hype digital I I keep my cynicism quite narrow I think it's exciting you know um, you, you think know, Coke buying Costa I is genuinely exciting. think that's, why is that exciting do you actually mean that do you genuinely I I, <laughs> I woke up and I'm getting a bit nervous now I woke up and I read that and thought that's really interesting you know that's you know someone has thought about that someone has decided that as a strategy someone has thought a little bit out of the box there you know probably I mean they're both beverages but in quite different industries different approaches similar (laughs) colour Um, yeah I think that's genuinely interesting I'm sorry having a passion about marketing is not a bad thing if you work in marketing I didn't didn't realise that you were so passionate about it and Coke's quite an interesting brand I I was in the back of a taxi (laughs) in Cannes and I was telling you this story and this guy said to me something really interesting was that Coke's a really conflicted product because it's got a, a can which is bright red which means danger and the fluid is black. It's like it, it's everything you wouldn't do if you did it from scratch. Yeah, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll warm everyone to the brand with a really defensive colour and a black liquid. You just you would never choose to do those things. But yet, it's this happiness. They've chosen. And, and Costa, which is almost red, which is like a dark brownie maroon, maroon. Let's call it. So actually, one of my hobbies is traveling the world and seeing how Coke has brought its uh, one brand policy to life, which is they, they made a decision a couple of years ago that basically everything should be red. And they seem to be trying in a fairly haphazard, though I'm sure deeply strategic way, in different markets. Like in Spain, basically the can is red. And in the Coke Zero, you're lucky if you can spot like the tiniest bit of black around it. In the UK, they kind of go for this like round Coke red thing in the middle of it all it's fascinating um, but probably a talk for a different podcast that no one would listen to I have to say that following you and social media is the, probably the most depressing things I've ever done because I think most of last year you were just on holiday with your partner having an amazing time it was and I think the key thing to learn from that is that social media <laughs> is not an accurate depiction of one's life 
uh, and it turns out that if you travel a lot for work and photograph the like two hours where you were on the way from the hotel to the airport, you can make it look fabulous. Uh, you, you took some interesting routes from the uh, from the hotel to the airport, that's for sure. But <laughs> we're, we're not going to get into critiquing your social. Right, so let's follow me on Instagram let's, as let's well. It's the... worldwide. A lot of my dog that I've got to warn you. So let's do the getting to know you questions. So, what was that last 10 minutes? What was your career? Get to oh, your really? Career. This Gosh. is you. Oh, right. Okay. I'm going to go deep. Yeah. So what is the marketing book you've bought for people most often uh, or that you would recommend? It's, it's like generic, but the greatest book of all time, How Brands Grow. But sneak thing. I mean, How Brands Grow, Byron Sharp, good man, like, you know, great book, transforming marketing thinking. Careful how you implement it. It's kind of long and Bless him, love him. It's a bit repetitive. So, so buy so How Brands don't... Grow 2, and the Whoa, first okay. chapter of that is a summary of the first book, and then you just quids in, job done. So for someone like me who's probably not going to read that book, can you help me he understand just... what the main points are? So <laughs> you should read that book, and let's, let's buy <laughs> your not, copy. I don't read. So oh, much. yeah. There's, oh, we can get great summaries online. How Brands Grow is just applying a bit of marketing science to the world of marketing, which isn't a bad idea. And you know, in, in the great spirit of digital sense, it challenges a lot of, of of how marketing thinks. Where we get really caught up on like our biggest super users, super fans, heaviest buyers, and it actually points out that the data would suggest that big brands are big because lots and lots of people buy them sometimes, not because a really really core dedicated fan base buys them a lot. And it just challenges a lot of classic marketing theory, which is all about honing in on who's your tightest who's your target audience who's that perfect person and chasing them and it says actually to be blunt a lot of people don't care very much about your brand they're very busy lives are much better things to do they probably only buy you once or twice a year uh, and your job at life is somehow to persuade those people to buy you which is often taken as like a really depressing death of marketing oh my gosh this is the end but it's actually a fantastic creative challenge because it's much harder to come up with a creative campaign that indifferent people care about uh, than one that like your super fans care about so what is the most useful thing you've bought with your own money that is useful for work so i thought about this for quite a long time okay, the cool. only thing i could come up with is clothes. <laughs> You're because, not the first person to say Because that. I feel like if I don't wear clothes to work, it's a nightmare. I don't know what I've bought in my own money that helps me with work. Um, let's, know, let's go into detail on the clothes. So do you... Do partly you, because arriving at, naked at work is inappropriate. Yeah. Um, Depending on where you work. But, uh, most places. So what? So do you, do you feel that you wear work clothes at Diageo or do you feel you kind of wear the Diageo uniform even though they don't make you wear a suit? They don't make us wear a suit. I feel I've always worn clothes that I feel confident and comfortable in. Um, and there's, there's something to be said for, obviously, you know, within what you're allowed to wear in your work, um, dressing in a way that you feel personally empowered. And I think, I mean, at Diageo, actually, people wear a really broad range of things. You, know, you can come in with a Guinness T-shirt on, if you like, and then you can come in the next day with a, with a full-on suit. So I, I think it's not a, a, a judgy environment in that sense, but I've... You know, I tread some middle ground between that. It was a slightly facetious answer. I didn't have a, I didn't have a deep philosophy behind it. Um, so next question <laughs> is, well, and this, this is this is a bit emotional. But what is your biggest work fuck up that has set you up for success? Oh, well, I did. I used to in a previous job. I worked on a on a brand um, for legal reasons. We went exactly say what it was but we did a we did a a twitter promoted trend um and fairly on during that trend let's say about 1201 they start at midnight so let's say right from the very start it turned out that if you clicked on that trend rather than well you you saw our fabulous message you know it was brilliant wonderful but straight underneath that you saw that the naked picture of a guy's ass with our (laughs) product very well and like you know you know people would pay a lot of money to style it as well as they had. Very well placed, but up, said Derriere. And this was a a challenge because basically, you know, the whole of Twitter when it woke up in the morning was going to to see that image. Um, And the fact that this is an unknown marketing story and that people don't know about it is is a, you know, is is a great story for how we managed to react really blooming fast and be like, we were a bit naive in what we were doing here because ba- basically the, the idea was to get people to send the pictures of themselves with our product into us 
and we had like a cartoonist who was going to draw really fun pictures of them. And obviously we imagine these fabulous, wonderful, brilliant, creative, positive poses, and we just got that. And that was the first entry? That was or one, po- of, one entry. of the first, and also widely repeated, because it was <laughs> clearly the funniest. But we, I mean, we acted fast, and uh, we, we changed some things in the trend, and we changed the term, and we made sure that we weren't accidentally... Uh, exposing the entire nation to that picture um, and so I think I learned a lot from that in terms of A just the need to react and like I think people can have a sense of like you know you've got an idea of how your campaign's going to work you press live and you come back two months later and see what happened whereas actually in this day and age you kind of need to be optimising and looking and being willing to you know sometimes quite radically change direction I guess also slightly depressingly, uh, I learned that, you know, you always have to think about the worst possible thing that can happen in a situation, you know. It's, uh, I think some of the big media platforms have learned that although they might have really big positive visions for the world, people like people like to take things and use them in the, the funniest, dirtiest way possible. I think that's a given. <laughs> it's, a, it's a given that we should all plan for. Your, uh, your, your friend... Um, uh well, the lady you were talking about downstairs will not reveal her on the, the podcast, who may or may not be moving back from Australia, <laughs> said that uh, there was always um, a, a time to cock ratio. Really? Like, no matter how what campaign you did. It's just it was, a, a mere matter of time. Just, like, there was just a, you can launch whatever you want in terms of a thing. Uh, consumer engagement thing competition and it would appear you know the, fr- the front row and when I was in my, early, in my early days when I did some Cadbury stuff and I literally did man the front row of social media for them there's I mean it's a it's an eye-opening experience to be the kind of the, the, <laughs> the person seeing how people respond and react to your brand also just learning that there are just some people that with the best will in the world you cannot make see any sense and those people are wonderful and great consumers and we should support them but they're bonkers Indeed. Um, right, okay, so you painted a beautiful picture in everyone's head there. So, okay, so this Every is, I'm helps. dying to know what you say to this question. So if you had a digital media budget of 10 million quid to get any message out there, be it personal, professional... What would what I do? Would yeah, well, fine. So the pe- the you can go live tomorrow. The most depressing message. thing in my life is I'm like straight away like, that's not enough money, you know. <laughs> like, I, need, I need more than that. What, what, are you doing? what are you doing with that small amount? <laughs> we're going global, we're doing the UK. Um, I mean, well, as established earlier, obviously I take my own tweets <laughs> and promote to the world my vision of a digital sense. I'd li- oh, I don't know. I'd like to think I'd have a more, uh, if I had total flexibility to do that, I think uh, things I'm passionate about um, are to do with uh, like bullying and labels and uh, helping young people understand to coin another phrase and everybody's put the money behind that, that, you know, it gets better. Um, and I think social media, I'm sort of super, super proud to have worked in digital marketing for the last 10 years and kind of been um, really involved in the evolution of social media, but I'm not blind to the fact that you know it's created challenges and it's created problems along the way um and you know one of, one of my best friends is like a phd child psychologist and likes to occasionally quiz me on whether i feel morally responsible for some of the challenges that that kids face today and i think there's there's a truth in that i think you know at, partly as marketers but more just as as humans you know there's a generation of kids growing up today that faces like a huge amount of pressure that we frankly didn't have to to do you know always being connected always having to curate their life always having to hear from people uh, and I love to be able to sort of tackle that give hope to people who are kind of in a in a dark place for whatever you know whether they're gay whether they're fat whether they you know whatever they're being bullied for or challenged by uh, it would be nice to be able to like almost individually maybe we could do some like personalised marketing at scale because you know that's what we should be doing in industry reaching out to those people and just being like, you know, you're gonna, you're fabulous, you're going to be great, and uh, don't worry about them. So where's that come from? I, I, I love that idea of spending 10 million quid on, <laughs> on dynamic creative. Um, and, and your friend... <laughs> AI-driven you dynamic creative is what I'd probably ideally do. Um, and... So your friends uh, did a PhD. Sorry, I missed the. A P- he did a P- He did a PhD studying like autism and childhood development. And, and this is what's made you feel that you're fl- uh, so slightly guilty. He, or? Not, he challenges you. Uh, I mean, I used to. I used to work for a, a charity, uh, like a, a youth training charity. Well, I think throughout my life, I've always been aware. I mean, I wasn't 
I don't have like a massive personal sob story. Like I, I don't think I was ever like full on, I wasn't bullied or anything, but I've, you know, always been conscious that, you know, in this world of social media, it, and I think like parents and kids are like a bit, a bit ill-equipped to understand like how you help people, how you support them. What, what, when, when, when should your kid have a smartphone? When should they be on social? Uh, I mean, a lot, a lot of this is quite, separate from my marketing world especially at Diageo when we only talk about people when they're adults yeah um but yeah I don't know it's just always a passion point of mine I've been you know I've been a governor at at school um I've seen like you know firsthand it's difficult to understand where the boundaries are around so how the school that you you were the governor at how are they dealing with social and digital (laughs) and mobile yeah, I mean, they they had like a no phones during school policy. So you basically had to put them in your locker at the start of the day and, and take them out at the end. And, you know, they were pretty good at confiscating them if you didn't. But, I mean, that doesn't necessarily solve all the problems. Kids still all have phones and they still... Cont- I mean, lots of great things come out of this technology as well, you know. It connects people who wouldn't. It helps people find like-minded people. If, you know, if you're a, a gay teenager growing up now, you can go on YouTube and find really positive, powerful stories about, you know coming out and things like that so i'm trying to paint too bleak a bleaker picture but i just think it's something that it's it's good to be conscious of you know there are really great things that come with technology and with great power comes great responsibility and so and so who should be owning that it gets better message is that the brands that you work for um, or is that teachers or uh the, like the brands i currently work for i don't think should own it it gets better kids message i think we should maybe not. Fo- focus on maybe not. speaking to legal drinking age consumers about other positive things um i i mean i think s- some brands can have a role in play I'm, I'm always um cautious about brands like tacking on a sort of completely made up purpose for no good reason but uh there are some brands in some categories where, where it makes sense to play in that space and where you know they they can do powerful things and sometimes that's really pushed and forced and sometimes it's just to do with inclusion and adverts and how you present people and how you cast people and how you uh you know show really good positive behaviors um no i I think it's it's, you know there are are wider questions there for another time around (laughs) for another time (laughs) my podcast to me but um but yeah, that's a really interesting point. That's the best answer we've had to that question. Absolutely. I love, <laughs> I love that idea if it gets better. Um, we're going to move away from that brilliant answer to a very different question, which is, in the last five years, which new belief or behaviour has improved your work life? I got much better at not being a slave to my inbox. So I, I used to be quite like coming in the morning and open my emails and see what's top and I mean it's it's <laughs> basically a uh, case book uh, bad behaviour but see what's top and see what the question is and, and tackle it I think sometimes especially when you have like really big projects or like something really meaty you have to tackle it's quite tempting just to kind of open Outlook or other email clients are available and just like say what's someone asking me right now what have I flagged let's just you know work from my email or even um the fact that sometimes, you know, I get quite passionate about work. I don't mind occasionally working outside of hours or something to get something done. But sometimes you, you fire off a whole load of emails thinking you're, like, getting stuff done. But all that does is fire off emails back at you. So how, you know, whether there are key projects you're working on, key things, how do you really effectively use your time? If someone's, if there's a whole load of questions up in the air, can you just get people together for a meeting? And meetings don't have to be an hour. Spoiler. I love, you know, you know that's another good, valid learning you know, everyone puts in a meeting for an hour. It's like, no, put in a new meeting for half an hour or less. Um, and have a really good, quick conversation. Just avoid that whole backward and forwards and emails. And yes, I still make time in my life just to sift through my email inbox and find out, you know, sometimes there are things that you have to reply to and you can't just ignore your emails. But I think really consciously, because it, I mean, it's, for me, it's almost like an addictive behavior, like open your inbox and like reply to five emails and, you know, I'm achieving things today. I have to quite consciously think, you know, even like close. So how do you do it? So what is your well, sometimes to like managing this? So partly I block out times in my diary where I know I'm going to work on a, a proper project, and when I'm doing that, I often close Outlook because you know we all, we all have a good notification, don't you? And you're working on something, and up pops the new email. Oh, I turn those off. off. People well, who have notifications of turn, 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 turn off Are the you notifications me? because it makes you know no sense. there's no there's no way to keep focusing on project A when like bing it's come no. up over here. Um, 
making time and then at the same time making time I deliberately keep um, time free every morning where I'm like if there's someone I need to call or someone I need to have a, a conversation with today I'm going to try and pin them down the first hour of the day when often other people have fewer meetings and stuff anyway um, I'm still a bit terrible at it like I'm trying to pretend like I'm some sort of work life guru but but surely with Google's like, apparently Google have hired 40% of the world's AI talent that but kind of, even if that's half true, Good it's on still, you. still quite amazing. But really, like with that computing power, and also they have access to everyone's emails, right? And they can anonymize all that stuff, and they could. That is an incredible training database, right? Surely they must have a more sophisticated algorithm than going. Here's an email. Here's the emails from your banking clients. <laughs> here's the emails from travel companies. Like it's so rudimentary. Whereas well, really, in, surely in ten years' time, it's go, it's going to be more like her. It's going to be like you've got to read these three emails now, Jerry. Everything else can wait till one o'clock because we know you've got a meeting. True. With I mean, there are some. Other. I know some real power email users in my company who have like all these <laughs> What's like a power email users. All these have up so many like rules and stuff, and you have to learn. You have once you learn their rules, you can break them because they're like if they're ever like more than one person copied in an email, it goes in like box B. If they're ever in carbon copy, they just never see it. Um, and bits like that one of my one of my favourite things at the moment is like the emerging world of like recommended replies to things like Gmail starts doing it LinkedIn starts doing it and like people send you emails LinkedIn's way better LinkedIn's like yeah man thumbs up whereas Google's like okay I'll no, get back to you my personal <laughs> honestly I just really embrace just using whatever they say even if it's like relatively irrelevant and I have to write an entire separate message just trying to think about what conversations we've had Tom and whether all of those are automated yeah, by both, AI. Both, um, both I just really like I find it really satisfactory just to click like, like even my mum emailed me this morning and the first I'm on a call call me later the first half of my email was like weirdly dictated by the first few things that Google said some of which were half relevant and when I wrote like a few like lines that actually may, may have made sense and she probably just thinks I'm mad but I found it oddly satisfying or in Facebook where like sometimes you're like talking to someone naturally and this weird like, M thing comes up and it's like oh you're planning an event and I'm like I'm not really but yes I'm going to click it and see what happens and it gets really messy and then you've accidentally created a Facebook event which you didn't mean to but and it's, I think it's the same as Clippy and it's, Microsoft Clippy oh my gosh so it looks like you're writing a letter it basically <laughs> is and despite it being 20 30 no 20 years later yeah. um, sometimes it feels like it hasn't moved that far the best thing is have you done any of those tweets where you like start and you write I'm feeling I mean you just have to press like whatever word your operating system like suggests and it just comes out of this ridiculous stuff and mine is always about church even though I don't say the word church very often <laughs> it's always like I'm tell- I, you know I'm telling people today I've been to church I'm like, so, so I think those recommended replies are the perfect indication of how AI isn't going to take over anytime soon and I'm going to go back to Google and their massive training data set they have the biggest training data set in terms of language of probably anyone I don't know maybe WeChat or something I don't know yeah. um, and if all they can come up with is Okay, I'll call you later. Or sounds good! <laughs> exclamation. If that is the peak of their computational creative ability, I think the copyright this of is, this world. I mean, this is this is part of the part of the, the heart of my digital sense. So at the moment, we have run these two slightly weirdly different narratives in the world of digital. One which is like Facebook, Twitter, and Google have evolved to this supreme, all-knowing sense where they know absolutely everything there is to know about our lives, what we're thinking, what we're talking, and frankly, can write conversations for us target us like based on the, the the town we were born in and exactly which date we opened our bank account and it's terrifying and scary and then we have the odd reality of my facebook news feed which is like <laughs> selling me like weird festival wear or like you know are you thinking about building a, a, a loft extension i don't even have a loft to extend so you know there's there is at times a division there and, and certainly i would argue ai assistants and their ability i mean i mean i love those ai assistants you have at home but like the fact that if you say one word wrong to Alexa, she hasn't the faintest idea what you've talked about. Like, you know, you can say, Alexa, turn the lights on in the kitchen. And she's like, absolutely no idea. Alexa, turn the kitchen lights on. And she's like, yes, Jerry, I've done that for you now, master. Right, I, I, I've had a couple of beers, so I should probably not talk about this, but please, if anyone works for either Google Home <laughs> or Amazon Echo, you don't have to tell me every single time the thing that I've asked oh, you to yeah, do. Yeah, I've could done you, that. Could you play Hey Jude by Beatles? Playing Hey Jude <laughs> by the Beatles on Spotify. 
I, I, oh, <laughs> yes. I'm, I'm ahead of you there, love. And like Sam, you know. so I, I'm fully into the like the home connected home experience to like okay. unnecessary degree. Tell me about your unnecessary. Oh degree. my gosh! So my favourite thing, basically, what I achieved this past weekend, which. <laughs> Well, maybe you'll appreciate it. No one else in my life has appreciated it so far. So I have, like, the, the new Nest doorbell, which you can, you can, which is, like, a camera. Not Nest. Yeah, Nest. He has a camera, and you yeah. ring it, and it's fine. And so I, someone rings the doorbell, and that pings yeah. up. You get a notification. I, yeah, and I got it a couple of weeks on. ago, but much to my frustration, it doesn't work with Amazon Echo, because, you know, awkward, you know, not, not friendly. Well, it doesn't know. work with the Amazon Echo um, show. No, with any of them. Well, so the doorbell rings and you want Amazon Echo to tell you your doorbell's well, ringing. Well, clearly you do. Let's move on past that. So I had Amazon Echo around my house, but this was a floor. So How I many went Echoes do you have in the house? Um, like I've, got, I've got a show in the kitchen and a couple of dots unnecessarily close to each other. So when they talk to each other, they're just like... <laughs> when you say Alexa, oh, it's no. like... Bing! All, okay. all like three of them. Why would you do that to yourself? Um, anyway... Tech, tech forward okay, yeah, but now yeah, I have a Google on. Home as well because when you ring the doorbell Google Home announces someone is at the door and I, which also the doorbell ringer does but this is better because technically if it knows the person which really only knows me and my partner so it's relatively niche so it, it tells you who they the are no. but you know you think that's good and then I got Chromecast which I didn't have because my TV kind of does all the YouTube it's a smart TV but it doesn't do Chromecast so I had to get a blooming Chromecast so now not only does it do that but it turns on the TV and shows the doorbell picture on the front the only slight flaw and God bless you Google is that for whatever reason it's it's quite slow like it takes about 20 seconds to like like, it happens straight like the TV is on the announcement is made and then the nest just like spinning wheel appears for like 15 seconds and like I wish I lived in a house where the door was more than 15 seconds away. <laughs> but by that time, I could have been there and back three times. And how much effort was it to link all those things together? Um, well, after my initial frustration that it wouldn't work with the Amazon, it actually works surprisingly well, um, which is a far better experience than I had when I also tried to... I managed to install um, light wave lights in my house, which is... Just like, you know, so Alexa can control your lights. Lightwave. Lightwave. It's right. a, you know, other companies are available. It's just a, okay. a technology. Why do you want to say that? Like, you're going to get in shit. I might you. get, like, sued by, like... You don't, you don't um, work. It's not the BBC. It's not. Like, Why am I doing this, then? <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, I don't know. I just feel that's a funny thing you say when you're on media. Uh, no. Well, anyway, no. so I did that, and that was, like, a right battle against you know you had to randomly find you had to change settings in so your like server Philips U type stuff right? yeah it's like Philips U but it's a, it's like it actually ends up being built into your light switch in your wall and maybe for that reason and whoa to go about uh, this is completely so it's built into your light switch yeah right? and you've got to go you, you, got have to, you, you just switch out your light switches rather than switching out the bulb it's a bit more I mean we were doing a bit of a redevelopment uh, in the house but um but that was like a lot of these things the, the light, actually, the doorbell went quite well. A lot of my other forays into connected home, even like things like Sonos and stuff, I find like trying to get those things to speak to each other is an absolute nightmare. And yeah. it makes me think they were quite a long way away from mainstream have, adoption. Have because you managed um, Google, or sort of Nest and Alexa? I, I can't, like, so turn, Alexa, turn the heating up. Can't get that out of the way. She, no, I can do that. She right. can control my heating. It's been the summer since I taught her, so I've never had to. But uh, she can she can talk to that one. Those two get on well enough. It's just the doorbell they've had a falling right. out with. Well, that is, do you know, that really reminds me of being pre uh, startup entrepreneur guy because I can't afford to do any things. Oh, I was still working for an I agency. Did, oh, you got to... all that shit free, is that what you're saying? No, I didn't. I had to pay for it all. No. I know. But dear Facebook, Google, Twitter, whoever else makes this stuff, they didn't give it to me. No, you should, you know, you should I drop, did, drop I got a Chromecast once, but I didn't need it at the time, so I gave it away to my brother-in-law, and now that was a previous job as well. Um, no, they just don't give you random electrical oh, you, items. You, you got, Am I doing you, it wrong? You, you may drop those hints. I would have thought, anyway, we are past the halfway stage, oh, and we no. are now going to get on to no, your... I'm really passionate about that still. Because my fundamental thing is, like, if it's not 100% perfect, how does, it, how does it ever catch on? Because you have to, like, fiddle with settings in your router and stuff, and, like, my mum can't do that. So, so I the think connected home needs to come on a little bit further, I think. I think you need to buy a house with an operating system. So oh, you yeah. were going to a bar at home or whatever it is. Because we're exactly those kind of... <laughs> you know, that's, obviously, that's what we do in Chelmsford or somewhere. And you go, okay, do you want Bixby, Siri, Google, or, you know, Cortana? And you go, oh, oh this is a happen. Cortana house. And then... So yeah, well, you br- that's not going to happen. You, okay. you bring in... 
whatever device, and then it just you know it just speaks. That to would the, be ideal. Yeah, you know, living thinking. Do, they, do new developers put that stuff in yet? Maybe, maybe not. One of the things I find most striking about like cars at the moment is they're going really big on like we've got Apple CarPlay. And Apple CarPlay, I mean, like it's nice and wonderful everything, but you, you you can actually like install it in your car for about like three hundred quid or something on the stereo. But you have like this like you know fifty thousand pound cars advertised on the telly, and the thing they're going hard for is like a three hundred quid upgrade. But and do you do you drive? Do you have a car? I do drive. Right. And what's I, your? Car I don't have Apple kit? CarPlay. It's too, it's too old to take that, unfortunately. Right, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Got a nice little Volkswagen, but you know, it's not 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 in that world yet. I don't drive enough. I don't drive to work. I only drive to take the dog to parks. Which is actually quite a lot of driving. Wow. And have you got any dog tech? Um, no. But I've, li- I've looked into those like GPS trackers and stuff because I'm a bit phobic about like, him maybe one, one day running away. And it's also so you can... like, or something, isn't it? like come on. No, they charge you like a monthly fee, like 30 quid a month or something. Well, to know where your dog is. To know where your dog is. And also like to know how much he's exercised and stuff. Yeah. If you... Yeah. Okay. But then I'd get like I'm. I feel like I'd be quite a pushy parent, so I'd be like, <laughs> "Mate, Henry, you've only you've only exercised like twenty <laughs> bars today. You're going out there in the garden. You're not coming in tonight." Well, that's good. It's sort of good, and it's sort of maybe not. I don't know. Maybe it's just good. Okay. Right, we're gonna we'll get, get this, one. We're gonna get this back on the marketing. Oh yeah, it kills me. Oh my gosh. Um, so your shiny <laughs> new object is. I want to talk about augmented reality. You can talk about which augmented is like reality. a talked about thing, and people like talk about it as if it existed. It's here now, and it's what it's, is it in twenty eighteen. Well, I mean, augmented reality is that magic thing where, like, you open your phone and through some form of application or something or other, you've got your camera open and you're looking at the world around you and the power of technology is layering magic stuff that's not really there on it. Most famously, most by far the most widely used, I would say, you can fact check that later, is Snapchat. You know, it's, you know, whether you think about this augmented reality or not, all those kind of crazy face masks, weird 3D effects. That is almost certainly by far the most mainstream uh, adoption of augmented reality at the moment. And you can take augmented reality to some sort of super far off extreme where we have kind of contact lenses where the whole world is layered on. And, and even as I'm looking at you now, I'm like secretly looking at your Instagram feed. Oh, that's weird. When were you there? Behind your head. Um, and maybe that will happen. Or maybe we'll decide that like actually the phone's quite a nice balance between like I can see what I want to, but not not all the time. But uh, there's, there is a sort of a massive, slightly behind the scenes battle going on in terms of who becomes the augmented reality platform. Because a bit like your operating system for the house, eventually you're probably not going to want to have like six different augmented reality apps, which you're like, oh, I'm going to flick between this app and this app and this app. You're just going to want to have, you get your phone or your contact lens or your glass or whatever out and they just have a layer of augmented reality that's either giving you information on the world around you it's an, an app it's showing you what your ikea furniture is going to look like in the corner and it's it's not massively publicized but like all the big tech players um are trying to position themselves in that space and own it like uh, apple has like its ar kit which is like trying to make it really easy for developers on their platform with their tools and their technology to build AR. Google has its own equivalent for Android. Facebook has an open source AR platform where they're saying, hey, developers, come build stuff on our platform. And a lot of that is is echoing where Snapchat is in terms of its crazy effects and it makes your selfies great. Um, but maybe it's the precursor to the world or when you open the Facebook app, uh, actually you can open your camera app and you can point it at people and it shows you their Facebook profile and and slightly crazy stuff like that, which potentially has some privacy concerns that we'll eventually look through. <laughs> so, for, I mean, for me, it's like super early days and any sense that we're seeing what augmented reality is going to be and going to do, like at the moment, it's all fairly trivial. Like you can open up a map and point it in the right direction. Um, but actually, there, there's some, even, I mean, I guess slightly, but there's some, even even in that world, some really interesting uses that, um I, I was judging some awards recently and, and there was just an, a, a Google had built this really, really simple app that literally was augmented reality. You opened it up and you, it showed you which direction to face for Mecca if you want to pray to Mecca, right, which obviously uh, hundreds of millions of people do. And it was just a really simple, I mean, it wasn't complicated, it wasn't advanced, but it was actually a, a use of that augmented reality that's actually useful. Um, and that, I think, is what it's, it's missing a bit at the moment. Like The technology is, is kind of there. It's It's been there for quite a few years, you know, since, you know, since the smartphone, since iPhone, technically you've been able to do augmented reality. 
they've made it a lot easier for developers now, but we still need some really like standout, oh my gosh, have you done this? Have you tried this? Um, this is a, like a really amazing thing that's only possible versus, via augmented reality versus at the moment it's it's slightly gimmicky and, and therefore no one's really sure why they'd want to do it. And you were there kind of at the start of brands in AR. I mean, I'm often called the father of AR marketing. <laughs> you probably are. Well, really? not yet, but on the back well, of this podcast, someone <laughs> might. Yeah, we, um, I worked on a Cadbury project where we were the very first ever blippable thing. Uh, blip AR, um, where um, those guys, like, yeah, really ahead of their time in terms of, of wanting to bring AR to the masses, um, came to us and said, you know, we would like to make it so every single chocolate bar uh, that you guys make in the UK, basically, you know, probably one in most houses or certainly just, you know, never more than a couple hundred metres away from one is, is blippable. And at the time, it was actually in the lead up to some of the, the work we we're doing around the Olympics and we had the the... God bless it, Spots v Stripes campaign, and we were all about playing games, and so we made it so you could open any, get any Cadbury chocolate bar, open Blipper, and uh, a sort of a, sim- a simple couple of games would pop out of it, and you could kind of play and explore. So I've got a kind of meta question here, being a sort of ex-sales guy. How the fuck did an unknown AR startup land a deal with Cadbury to make every single one of their products blippable that is like the that is the the deal of the deals de- it's sort of the deal of deals there, there was it's, it's, it's a new technology it's a new client it's unproven and you went all out yeah well we Did didn't take it out for a series of really nice lunches or what that must be it. no the reason the reason it's not the deal of all deals is that uh, Cadbury's themselves did absolutely nothing to their packaging to change it at all so none of the packs said it was blippable Blipper just took the existing packs, took everything that was out there and made it blippable. So the, the big challenge around it was that every everyone who had a Cadbury's bar technically had this amazing blippable game in their hands. But you needed to also but download the app. You had to you had to separately be told that Blipper is a thing and it exists and therefore you need to do it. So in many ways it was more proof of concept and I think, you know, as that has evolved, you know, brands have learned that if you... And what re- were the stats on it? Did it work? Um... So that we had, a, we kind of had a, a geographical heat map of the UK of where it happened, and it, it, it's fair to say a large percentage of the blipping was in like the Soho agency area. How much percent? I would say possibly up in the nineties, <laughs> cl- close to. Well, um, expect that, and it was, it was in many ways a, a proof of concept, and um, you know, it, it showed the technology worked, and, and they have done some really other. Um, good things since then but I mean, it also shows some of the challenge which is you know if people don't know what AR is and they don't know that they can interact with things and if everything isn't ARable we're not going to go around randomly trying it and if you ha- and even you know if you have to download a specific app and you have to you know pick the right app for the right product it's, it's quite tricky which again I mean Apple isn't or Google aren't saying they're doing this at the moment but you know, there'll come a time when you, you know, from your, from your, when your phone's locked, you can open the camera. Why doesn't AR just naturally become a part of that? Why, why isn't there an, a lightweight AR experience that's that's right there from the beginning? And that's I'm, actually I'm really worried about that ever happening because um, <laughs> people take the piss out of me for saying this, but I think that since the iPhone supported the QR code, it's like it's made it a, an uncool, but yet. <laughs> really useful tool like point your phone at this thing and it will take you to the website Brilliant. yeah had qr codes done that from day one then they'd be everywhere they would be like they are yeah whereas the idea if if the handset manufacturers can't get it together to make a qr code work out of the box the chances are that they're going to build a lightweight uh, yeah ar system that doesn't slow the phone <laughs> opening like It'd be pretty that's, well, that's interesting i mean well, you can always say that snapchat already opens in its camera technically doesn't give you AR there and then but you're only one press away from it I think the, the point about uh, QR codes or NFC which is an even more magical way of achieving that or AR one of the slightly convoluted things and, and challenges I think in that space is that they are adopted first and sometimes exclusively by advertisers so NFC in terms of like a way of you know sometimes you can find outdoor posters or or things like that, or QR codes are used on adverts to get more information. Basically, it's something that a typical consumer has never done. Uh, like, my mum has probably never scanned a QR code. 
And the first reason we're giving her to scan it is so she can find out more about the new Ford Focus or something. And it's it's quite a leap that, sh- that you know, and certainly um, there are things like the fact that Snap codes are kind of a QR code and other platforms have those similar things. I think people are, are getting that user behavior. And it's that kind of stuff that normalizes it and says, actually, if I see one of these weird codes, I can scan it with my phone and I can get somewhere. But I think that's a challenge of, of something like, Blipper and QR codes and NFC, if we're like, consumers have never done this behavior before, and the thing that's going to super motivate them to do so is to find out more about my advert, is a bit of a stretch. Similarly, like with um, with Shazam, I love the Shazam a song, um, and there was a while where they were, and perhaps they still do, good luck to them. Shazam was trying to get people to Shazam TV ads. In fact, there we go, Cadbury's was one of the, in the very first ITV Shazamable TV break. Um, but for me, it was like this, the way into that would be to get consumers to Shazam the TV show. Like, let's say it's the X Factor, encourage people to Shazam it so that they they get extra features and extra functionality. And then when the ad break comes, they're on Shazam, they're already doing it. Maybe they'll just Shazam the ads. Instead, in that, they literally had an announcement saying, hey guys, we're now opening the world's first ever Shazamable ad break. Open your app now and get out, get more information about these adverts. I just think there's, there's a slight disconnect between the reality of like consumers being willing to be mildly entertained and watch adverts versus, oh my gosh, I was so excited by that advert. I'm going to download a new piece of technology just so I can hear more from you. It works in an agency deck though, doesn't it? It works in an agency deck. Here's the works, user experience. You know, and if you do it as a business, I think you innovate and learn and, and get learnings from that that may be more or less scalable so that's that's <laughs> fascinating so the idea that new tech needs to be normalized by companies or consumers that are, are not advertisers yes yeah, so ar has massive massive potential and a thing that's going to help untap it is something super simple like apple at their last developers conference whatever it was showed off this like really simple app which is basically a ruler you can measure stuff now using your iPhone, and thanks to you know AR Kit and the wonders of technology, it's pretty darn accurate. So we could be here and we could measure the size of this table and this microphone, this computer. Um, we could work out the volume. We could start, you know, IKEA has taken that, and they've, you know, you could put virtual shelves and things like that. And it's quite a small little thing, but I never have a ruler when I need one. If I can actually rely on that, that's quite useful, quite powerful, and that kind of stuff would actually. There's genuine utility, and it makes you realise that there are, you know, maybe that's not the right example. You can question the value of a virtual yeah. ruler, but you know, when we genuinely see there's utility and stuff. The other, I mean, the other stuff they demoed was all like uh, AR games, which were basically games that you could have much more easily played on your phone without the hassle, but they were now being projected on a table for no good reason, just to look cool for the first twenty minutes that you were playing. And that kind of stuff, and maybe I'm being a bit cynical there, is probably less likely to create mass adoption of these technologies. But the user isn't, like, they're just going to... It's just digital then. It's just stuff on a screen. Yeah. And I I get the point about it being normalised. Like, you hold up your Snapchat filter or lens or whatever it is, and you've got rabbit ears. and you're like, oh, that's Cool. It. But that's just Facebook. In their head, they're just like, oh, that's just Instagram. Yeah. And then, but to the, your funky ruler thing, like you're still going to go to an app store and download that thing. It's not going to, yeah, that's not going to get built into the camera. Is 5G going to change this? Uh, so Google, has, for instance, has started to show some very early things that maybe would be built into the camera. For instance, you can point at a business. They've shown demos of you point your camera at a business, just the native camera, and it can bring up information about like Nando's or whatever it is. So it could happen. Uh, is 5G going to change that? Um, maybe. I'm not, I'm not sure that bandwidth is the, like, the biggest barrier to some of that stuff. But I, I guess in terms of it being like really rich interactive experiences with you know, 3D renders and stuff, maybe having a, a massive data pipeline in the back end is going to help. Uh, maybe. And so one thing I don't think I've got to the bottom of, and all, all of this is fascinating to me, but I, I still don't understand why AR for Jerry Dakin, out of all the things you could have chosen and all of your points I, um, are interesting, but like, you, you care about this, man. Like, why is that as a, as a guy who adds up 
these huge partnerships at Diageo, like, do you feel that Diageo aren't doing it enough, or is like, is there an opportunity in spirit, or like, why? why well, basically, like, Campaign Mag from? asked me the same question at the start of the year, and I haven't thought of a new answer since then. So don't I'm you sorry. try and sneak out of that question? <laughs> well, I think um, I think it's partly because for me, it's a massive revolution battle. You know, like I, I said before, like people are going to pick a platform and, and stick with it, and you know without all the students, Facebook has, you know, if, if AR becomes the operating system of the future, which, you know, potentially, you know, when we have screens that are like on our glasses and things, it, it kind of does, you know, Facebook could really rapidly become obsolete if it, if it, you know, isn't your choice of platform to go to. So it either has to own that platform or really, really rapidly integrate with whoever does. I just think it's something that's not massively talked about that, um, and it's partly not talked about because there's not that much to talk about yet. All these platforms are building this technology and they're putting the pipes out and they're, you know, they're developer conferences. If you are bored and lonely enough to, to tune into them, which I am, they go really, really hard on this stuff. That's at the moment a really massive niche part of their product, a massive niche, a small niche part of their product, like relatively few people are using or doing. And to me, that sends a signal that those guys think that like, I have to get skin in the game here. I have to persuade developers to be building their AR on my stack or my tech. And that's because it's kind of this like weird, massive battleground. And why do I think it's interesting? I mean, I do think it's really interesting for advertisers and marketers. To my point earlier, I think it's tricky for advertisers to be the ones who lead that. Like I've, I've seen some interesting approaches to this. Like there was a, a, a brand who you know, had really interactive experiences that you can kick off based on a um, like a QR code, probably on a shelf in like Tesco or something. I mean, I don't know if you've ever been shopping in a supermarket, but stopping to get out your QR code reader and scan a thing and then spend 20 minutes engaging in like a butterfly hunt around the store is not necessarily what I think about when I'm in a supermarket. So you have to be really cautious about what's possible, what's not. At the same time, uh, like Diageo, we have like some categories that like, you know, whiskey... Um, you know, we are really we we are one of the world's biggest makers of whiskey. We have certainly the world's best whiskey brands, Johnny Walker, to name just one. Um, whiskey is a really complicated category. I work for a drinks company. I've not I haven't historically been a whiskey drinker. I've tried to get my head into it a little bit. It's a bit confusing. Like whiskeys taste very different. They have different flavors. They cost wildly different prices. Why? What's going on? They're mixed. They're blended. So there's some really interesting stuff that we are looking into, which is, you know, well, actually, could like an augmented reality experience be a really useful, educational, helpful thing there? And I think sometimes it's the simplest experiences that really work and, and actually drive utility, like Lego in their stores for probably more than five years has had that thing where you hold the box up and it shows you the 3D model on it. And it's nice because you don't have to download an app or anything yourself. It's built into the store and it's clever because it does something that, you know, a flat packaging can never do. So, yeah, it's, it's definitely something we're, we're looking at as, you know, Diageo, we have to be very responsible marketers and we have to consider how we make sure who would do that. But I think more than anything, we want to understand why anyone would do that and the value proposition of that. And there's no point creating like some crazy AR experience that, you know, the reality is no one's ever going to do. So I think the AR, in the way that you describe it, is in a bit of a tough spot. Because on one hand... It's chicken you, and egg. You've said... It's a 3D chicken and egg. <laughs> on one hand, you've said that uh, it can't be advertisers that teach the the market what a new technology is. As you said, like, oh, you've got to download this thing called Blipper, and then you've got to point it up. It's just too much work yeah. for it. Too much... Um, and brands don't have enough media budget to launch a category of technology to make their ads more interesting. And also, brands don't have enough money, really, in my experience, to build anything really that good in AR. Like, sure, they, like Lego is a is the okay. So, the, how many boxes actually have that AR experience on them? What, one, <laughs> four, ten, fifty. I've, I've tried to do it to things that haven't worked before. It's true, right, and okay. straight so, away the experience. So even even Lego that have like a. Oh, a bang on use case for it it's still not standard across like everything they do because there's yeah. a 3D like, I love build, new products and, like, all know, the time and yeah, yeah. yeah all, all that stuff um, so if if brands can't afford to create experiences that are going to create consumer demand and then the the platforms or the technology companies like Google's released a ruler 
you know, but how is it? Like, it's, um, there seems to be he a goal. To be, he there seems to be, to be suggesting there. that the ruler is not going to change the world. <laughs> no, it, it sounds lovely. There is a there is a golf there, and I guess the the answer and it, it's coming a bit is from sort of more consumer entertainment and you know entertainment brands and i think you're, you're starting to see you know the likes of of disney and people like that creating augmented reality experience like toy owners toy manufacturers obviously nothing that jazz would be interested in but helping uh you know making toys and games and, and you know potentially you you know thinking longer term you create a generation that's grown up with toys that they used to be able to you know my my nieces have a whole bunch of toys that have various interactions whether it's visual on a screen or through um like bluetooth with ipads and things and for them it's like perfectly normal that real world objects and digital devices would connect um and you know it's like that classic thing where you have kids who try and like who get annoyed when they can't when things aren't touch screens maybe kids will grow up being annoyed that why can't i interact with this connected object but yeah definitely like budgets are a challenge i think you know if everyone's first experiences of ar are like badly done awful experiences that add no value that's gonna set everyone back a few years we're, we're late enough in the podcast that most people have tuned out so i can say it's you know the sex no, people, the, people. the sex industry is what drives a lot of technology <laughs> so AR, ar sex will be an interesting thing that i um will personally uh, avoid but uh, <laughs> why would you avoid that um it just sounds awful <laughs> Well, there's, there's VR sex. Or something. VR, I think, yeah. yeah. I mean, well, you could, you could start with VR. VR as well is a technology that, you know, we could find one of those lovely uh, hype cycles and go back a couple of years and VR was like the massive revolutionary thing. And, and Do you have any VR kit at home? Uh, I've got like a Galaxy Gear VR, like, oh, you know. How's that? How often do you use that? Um, like, I don't use it. <laughs> okay. You're not know, tempted being a, a home gadget person by the uh, the wired free Oculus Go yeah, or whatever. Yeah, I'm very tempted. $200. I know, $200. super That's tempted. Not, I'll probably a man like. of your stature, but surely that you should have one in each room. No, I spent all my money on my, my oh, no, Alexas like already. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm very tempted by gadgets like that. I tend not to use them partly because. I'm a busy, a busy man. Actually, the only gadget I ever use is my Nintendo Switch because you can use it on the tube. So I haven't got pot, got to the point of using VR on the tube. But no, my, my, my VR falls in a very sim- <laughs> similar... I, I've never seen anyone do it either, though I look forward to. It's a similar trap. Like, the technology for VR is, is here now. Like, you know, whether it's, like, lightweight stuff, put your phone in a headset. You know, I, I don't use it really regularly, but I've used it, and that's a full-on VR experience, which, if you have a phone already... Uh, no, I mean from oh, the, okay. the Galaxy Gear. Okay, it's a yeah. full-on VR experience, which if you have a phone already, which let's be honest, a lot, a lot of people do, you know, you're only 50 quid away from having a really high-end VR experience or, you know, super high-end, you know, the, you know, Oculus, full-on systems, HTC stuff oh. where you can move around and things. It's mind-blowing. If ever you do it, it's super awesome. But, like, where is, like, the mainstream content that would make me want to do that again and again, you know? <laughs> Like there are films in VR, but they're kind of like normal films, but worse because rather than the director bothering to direct you in anything, you're like forced to look in every direction. And there are games in VR, but that's pretty like super niche. You have to be a full on hardcore gamer to really want to play that. So like the tech was there, and everyone was like, "VR is going to take over." But you know, what's my mum going to do in VR? You know, what is you know what is the casual person supposed to do in virtual reality? And the answer is, at the moment, we haven't necessarily got that. And actually, I mean, some of the most bonkers stuff you've seen presented in VR, but perhaps it is the answer. Like you know, Mark Zuckerberg, some of his F8 things, has done these really crazy things where he's like basically hanging out with his friends in VR, and it looks completely bonkers, and you know, it's all a bit awkward. But actually, maybe something like that is the answer that, you know, connecting people over distant spaces and allowing us to, you know, do that whole awkward conference, remote conference thing together right, with people. They can't, they can't even do calls. There's no, like, that's my biggest book about innovation in 2018. Why can't people do is, calls? I just want to do video conferencing. Just please. I don't, you can keep your VR headset. You can keep uh, your AR. You can keep your smartwatches. You can keep your AR. I just want to speak to this switched, person. We switched to Zoom and Zoom just seems to work. So, you know, as uh, advertised on London buses. Right. We are going to come back and talk. We're going to hold our whole hour on Zoom. 
um, in next time. I've got a couple of colleagues who would love to do that. (laughs) Right, okay, so just a very quick recap. Um, We talked about why you are so passionate about Digital Sense, uh, and you've talked a lot of it. I've got a bit distracted. I'm going to listen back to this. I talked an hour of nonsense. um, No, that did not happen. We got a bit distracted several times on uh, Costa versus Coke, (laughs) and... um, your amazing tech set up at home um, and you sort of admitted that you you could be the father of AR marketing and and, and, and yes uh, um, and thank you for defending that and actually defending my, it. technically it was my colleague Kate who really drove that project and I just stood next to her and went you're awesome well you can make a career out of doing that <laughs> um, but yeah thanks for going into such detail on AR um, as, as you said when we chatted earlier that we, it's not the first time it's been brought up and two of the people I respect most in this industry you and Amy Keane and for both of you to be so passionate about about AR, it's been brilliant for me to kind of push you on that and really, uh, really try and understand what what's in it for the brand and what's in it for the consumer. I'm still a bit confused, but it's great to talk about it. <laughs> so, if, if people want to get in touch with you and discuss AR or anything else, how can they do that? Probably like Twitter at J Dakin D A Y K I N. It's probably my uh, preferred medium of marketing debate. You can find me on LinkedIn as well if they like. Um, Always happy to debate things. Got a really interesting debate about TV versus digital this past week with a whole bunch of luminaries. If you're not randomly tweeting influential people in marketing and asking them for mundane opinions, you are missing out on <laughs> valuable Twitter <laughs> that experience. Is, that is a, a lesson in itself. Jerry, <laughs> that was perfect. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me.